Hi, this is Marcus Schneck with PennLive.com and the Patriot News. I'm at Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission headquarters in Harrisburg with uh, the executive director of the commission, John Arway. And we're talking about some uh, changes and some input from sportsmen about potential changes that uh, could be coming to the Fish and Boat Commission. Hi, John. Hi, Marcus. How are you? Good, good. And you? Great. Good. Okay, like I said, you have some sportsmen's forums coming up. We do. Um, we have forums around the state that we've just announced. And the idea is to get sportsman feedback uh, from our customers, anglers and boaters across the Commonwealth, or those that are interested in conservation, uh, to inform our new strategic plan that we're going to be moving forward with here in the near future. Okay. And most of these uh, sportsmen's forums are going to be held in conjunction and at uh, outdoor shows across the state. Correct. Yeah, we're uh, excited about it because, you know, the outdoor forums really attract uh, anglers, boaters, hunters, and others into those venues. And we're hopeful that while they're there, we can capture a little bit of their time and get their feedback onto, in, into the future of fishing and boating opportunities in our state. Um, the first one is at the out, uh, Great American Outdoor Show here in Harrisburg. And that is, uh, what date do you recall again? I've got the list of them. Uh, we will have it up on our uh, website, uh, an entire article listing all of the meetings. So that's not a big issue right now. Um, so anyhow, what kind of questions are you going to be asking uh, boaters and anglers at these forums? Well, really, we're hoping to hear what questions they're going to be asking us. Um, we're going to have staff presentations, real brief speed presentations from all our program staff to let anglers and boaters know what, what we do currently do for them with the resources that we have. Since we're a user pay, user benefit agency, our customers really fund our agency, unlike most other state government agencies where tax funds fund those agencies. We don't get a general appropriation from the legislature or the governor, so we have to earn our funds through fishing license sales, boat registration fees and the federal excise tax on sport fishing and boating equipment that sportsmen buy. And we've come to this point because uh, license sales have been declining and there hasn't been a uh, license fee increase for how long? Since 2005. 2005, so that's... Uh, 13 years. 13 years. Okay, Game Commission is in pretty much the same boat. Uh, but we're talking about Fish and Boat Commission today. Um, so that is really what has brought us here, right? Uh, it's a time to reassess where the money's going to go. It is. Uh, as you know, over time, um, the dollar deflates. By that, I, I mean you get less for a dollar today than you would back in 2005 or in 1995 or in 1905. And as a result of that, over time, every time inflation catches up to the value of the dollar and we can't afford to spend or pay our expenses, we go for a license fee increase. We sold our first license in 1919 for $5 to non-residents and 1922 for $1 for residents. And we live off of that model of uh, user pay, user benefits. And most other state fish and wildlife agencies around the country apply that same model because our forefathers back in 1937 developed this North American model of wildlife conservation that said the sportsmen really want the science to control the decisions, not the politics to control the decision. So as a result of that, the sportsmen, sportsmen fund what they get, and then they get input into the decisions that we make. Right. And uh, there's already been some cuts in the uh, past uh, several years within the agency, has there not? Yeah, actually, Marcus, um, just like any government agency, uh, uh, staff costs really drive uh, our expenses. Seventy percent of our budget is, uh, is, is personnel. So... In order to pay the extra expenses of health care and pensions, which go beyond general inflation, we've reduced staff from 432 people down to 378. So that's really allowed us to pay expenses up until now. And now we just can't cut any more staff without cutting programs. And in terms of cutting programs, uh, we have lost some uh, trout hatcheries already, haven't we, in the past several years? Not yet. Uh, we haven't made any cuts in trout hatcheries uh, yet. We, uh, we still stock 3.2 million trout. Uh, over 50 million warm and cool water fish, and we provide a million fingerlings to co-ops to, stock, to raise and, and stock out. So we haven't made any cuts yet. A lot of people think we, we did, but we haven't. Uh, but we've been able to tighten the belt and absorb those costs based upon cutting personnel and other expenses from the programs we have. I guess I'm thinking back to more than a few years ago when I guess it was 
there were a few hatcheries closed because of uh, effluent. Uh, they like uh, down at uh, Boiling Springs or Newville. There was a yeah, Big Springs. Big yeah, Spring, we closed yes. that, but that wasn't because of really finances. That was because of uh, environmental impacts to Big Spring, right. um, and that was back in the oh, early nineteen early nineteen nineties. Okay, so. I, I am going back much further than what we're talking about right now is the current situation. Are there hatcheries on the line now? Yeah, um, we have a six point two million dollar expense uh, that we have to have to make up with pensions and healthcare costs, and as a result of that, that comes out of our reserve fund, and we wanted to lower the burden on the draw from the reserve. So the commissioners gave me the ability or asked me, told me to to cut an additional uh, two million dollars from the budget which could include furloughs and facility closures. So in order to get to that, I went back to staff and we identified our Oswego Fish Culture Station, which we, where we raise trout, uh, our, our Union City uh, Fish Culture Station, which raises warm and cool water fish, and our Van Dyke Shad Research Station is a way that w where we could cut to, to achieve that $2 million expense threshold. They have not been cut. They are just under consideration as potential cuts? That's correct. They're under consideration, and we won't have to make that decision until July 1st uh, of this year, which is the beginning of our next fiscal year. And is there a capacity in the hatcheries that would be left if those were cut? Is there a capacity to replace what they do? There's really not. We're, at, we're at carrying capacity at all our fish hatcheries where we can only raise as many fish as we can fit in the barrel. Uh, and a lot of that is controlled by what, what our effluent uh, standards may be, like at Big Spring, where we can only uh, discharge a certain amount of effluent in the streams without impacting the uh, environmental quality of those streams locally. So as a result, we really can't fit any more production in the facilities we have. So if we do cut Oswego, which is our least efficient fish culture station, so we would save the most money by cutting 220,000 fish from production so that would lower our production to around 3 million trout a year from 3.2 million if we would do that cut. Okay, and, and that, if that cut did come through and there was that amount of reduction, that would mean adjustments in stocking. That's right. We'd have to find uh, places which we've already identified streams that would come off the stocking list based on a variety of criteria and uh, if we would have to move forward with that plan. But at this, past, this past week at the commission meeting, um, we identified, it's, identified some areas where we might be able to raise some revenues to offset some of those cuts ourselves. Outside of what the legislature has to do, which they have to approve a general fee increase for fishing licenses, which we've been trying to, trying to convince them to do for about the last five years, uh, we haven't been successful. Uh, so we looked internally and we've identified some ideas that we can uh, assess fees ourselves and see if we can generate some revenues to offset some of the cut, cuts that we might have to do. Can you give us some examples of what some of these fees or other changes might be that are already be under consideration? Sure. One example, and we're going to have these as questions at the public forums for to get public input about uh, you know how they would support or not support the kind of cuts we're talking. Uh, one would be, for example, a fee on on the summary book that you get with your fishing regulations. Now, you know, the Game Commission imposed a $6 fee, and they took a lot of heat for that. Uh, we're wondering if our anglers might pay a dollar for a book. Uh, and if they would, we're, we expect we might be able to earn about $350,000 from charging a dollar for a summary book. Uh, right now, a summary book costs us about $0.30 cents a copy. We produce over a million copies a year because of the advertising we sell in a summary book to offset the cost of publication. So if we could get an extra dollar, that would offset some of the kind of cuts that we would have to make by earning $350,000 a year off of that. We're also looking at uh, maybe selling ad space both on our website and in our Angler and Boater magazine. We never advertised in our magazine before, but that, that might be a way to lower the, the costs of the magazine. Um, we're looking at things like maybe voluntary stamps. A lot of our anglers say that we pay extra, extra money for our sport if, if you ask us to. So we're looking for maybe a wild trout stamp, a voluntary wild trout stamp or voluntary muskie stamp. Our muskie program costs us over a million dollars to raise and grow, grow muskie. So the muskie angler said, you know, we don't pay extra for our sport, but we, we'd be willing to do it. So we could see if they really would uh, pay if we created that voluntary stamp. You're using the word voluntary. Those would be stamp. voluntary. Uh, unlike the uh, pheasant stamp that the Game Commission started this year. That was not... Uh Voluntary. Correct. And it's interesting because the, the, the game law is a little different than the Fish and Boat Code in that the Game Commission has better, more flexibility than we do in creating those 
uh, special um, mandatory stamps and, or stamps and licenses. Fish and Boat doesn't. We have to go to the legislature for any mandatory license or stamp related to fishing and boating that we'd want to impose. Which I guess is why we've seen a lot of creativity from this agency in terms of new ideas that you've tried to, over the past decade or so. Well, I hope so. Uh, you know, we have to put our thinking caps on and try to figure out how we're going to manage uh, the resources to meet angler and boater expectations. And we've got a lot of creative ideas that we want to we want to try. Uh, some cost money, uh, unfortunately, and sometimes you have to invest money to make money. And and that's why one of the things we have to do. We're working with these R three initiatives, recruitment, retention, reactivation initiatives, and um, we're going to be trying a program down in Philadelphia called the First Catch Centers where we were able to fund that program in combination with Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. And we're going to be having these mobile platforms, not phones, but vans and trailers uh, wrapped in this eye-catching wrap uh, with some of our prime sponsors, including Geico and Boat US, Cabela's and Bass Pro, outfitting those with fishing and boating equipment, and then uh, bringing uh, kids in uh, to teach them how to fish at different points around the city of Philadelphia and in inner city Philadelphia when the fish are biting. You you tried something like that. Was it just this past year with catfish in Pittsburgh and Philly, was it? We did. We started out, as you know, with the Mentored Youth Trout Program, where we opened up all our uh, streams and lakes to uh, children and mentors trout fishing uh, the week before trout season. That's been extremely popular, and it's growing exponentially over time as people learn about the program. And it really gives the opportunity for uh, parents and grandparents and friends and family to teach kids how to fish. We tried the same thing with catfish this year, both in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia, and we had uh, a special stocking in North Park Lake in Pittsburgh and had, had uh, families come in and fish for catfish, showed them how to clean them and fry them, and they actually had a fish dinner there that day. And we did the same thing in Philadelphia along the Schuylkill River, except we did that with native catfish in the river, and everybody had a great time, and we're expecting to repeat those and maybe expand that next year. I got us off the track a little bit because I'm familiar with these programs and I think they're great for the kids, what these special opportunities that have been coming up. But I got us off the track on some other ideas that you, might be under consideration in terms of uh, dealing with the uh, finances. Yeah, I, I just uh, explained a little bit about some we call them operational changes that I can do as director uh, myself without really the board uh, act, any board action for rulemaking. Some of the rulemaking actions that our board could take would include uh, increasing use, P, use permit fees for unpowered boats. As you know, we have a launch permit and we have a boat registration that canoes and kayaks can, can both uh, uh, use if they're going to use public launches. And that helped pays for us to maintain those public launches, even though those launches were paid by motorboat, really the tax on motorboat fuels. Um, a lot of unpowered boaters use those launches, and this is our way of getting them to pay their part of the share for using those launches. Well, we're going we're gonna to be talking to DCNR because our law allows us to increase those fees consistent with the fees that DCNR sets for their launch permits. So we're going to be working with DCNR and seeing if we can increase those fees a bit uh, to, to compensate us for, for some of the, the, uh, the revenues that we need to maintain those, those boat launches. We wouldn't be talking a double fee since people who launch in state parks through DCNR would also already have their permit. So it probably would be a, a joint type permit under that situation. Yeah, that's what it is now. You can either buy a launch permit from DCNR to launch at their lakes, or you can buy a launch permit from us to launch at any, any public launch in the Commonwealth, or you can register your boat just like you would your power boat for the same fee, but you put a registration sticker on it. And what that does is it allows us to track your boat if somebody would steal it or if you would lose it. Okay. Now, are there other things on the table? Yeah, there's a couple other I'll, ones. I'll show the audience literally on the table. <laughs> okay. There's, a, there's some other ones, and we try to be innovative and creative and try to get everything on paper that we can think of. Some of them won't be popular, but we felt it was important to let the board know some of the things we could do ourselves. One of the least popular ones on the list probably is, is to charge all the senior anglers for a trout stamp. Uh, as you remember, when we created uh, the, the, the law back in 2015, or changed the regs, that required all, all new seniors to, to buy a, a trout stamp with their license every year, uh, we grandfathered in all the existing seniors. Uh, we estimate that if we would apply that to all seniors, we, we could probably earn um, about $1.2 million a year. 
Now, the current seniors wouldn't like that, and like I said, that probably wouldn't be an, a popular thing to do, but we, we thought it was important to just let the, uh, our Board of Commissioners know that that was one of the options if, if, if they would choose to do it. Um, another one uh, that would generate uh, substantial revenue would be a, a parking fee for Fish, Fish and Boat Commission facilities. So if you went to a, a parking lot, uh, one of our boat launches, and we see a lot of uh, non-fishing and boating use of those launches. People come and walk their dogs and go picnic at the launches, hike and bike, ride horses, and believe it or not, some of our facilities. Um, so if we would have a parking fee, that would generate um, almost uh, $2.6 million, we estimate, uh, every year. Uh, to help us, you know, offset some of the costs of shutting down Oswego and Union City and Van Dyke, as well as uh, cutting back in the cooperative nursery program uh, and, and some other cuts that we've identified. Right. Now, on a different topic, I had a question come in. I can see the questions running across oh, cool. the screen here. Um, one is, are there any changes coming up in bass fishing regulations from uh, in the Susquehanna River from Sun the Faber Dam in Sunbury downriver? No, right now we're holding steady. We took uh, some proposed changes to the board this past year, but the board said um, we should wait to see how the fishery responds. We should wait a little longer to see how the fishery responds to the regs that we put in place. Okay, so nothing new in no that changes. respect. Okay, and we just uh, learned uh, something about uh, the Department of Environmental Protection's uh, listing for the Susquehanna River. Yeah, they, um, they had recommended, and we were critical of that recommendation back when they said that they um, uh, didn't have enough information to impair the river. And by impair, that means putting it on a list so that we can start uh, you know, put together a plan to clean up the river. Now, you know we've done that for the Chesapeake Bay, and we're implementing that. And that has some uh, positive impact to the river, but the problem is the end point is the bay and not the river. So we argued that the river should have its own plan, which should be separate and independent of the bay. In the meantime, since we've made that argument, the river has improved. Uh, we've seen an improvement in the quality of the smallmouth bass fishery, and uh, we believe it's more related to Mother Nature than it's related to anything else. We've had a couple of cool springs, uh, high water springs that have uh, allowed us to get successful spawns of bass in the river. And as a result of that, we've seen the recovery of the bass population in the river, but you know it's very susceptible to change. It could, you know, the 2005 event that we saw where we had a tremendous kill of young fish in the river due to bacterial infections, could happen tomorrow if we got another low water, warm water year. So as a result of the improvements, EPA looked at the recommendation that DP submitted and said they're going to keep it in a holding pattern, much like with our regulations. They're, going to, they're not going to say it's impaired or they're not going to say it's not impaired. They're just going to wait, continue to monitor the river, and see if the river changes. Okay. I have a comment here about the trout stamp. And I'll just throw it out there and see what your response is. Get rid of the trout stamp. Well, if What we, would the impact be of getting rid of the trout stamp at this point? Well, we'd have to reduce the number of trout we stock. And the trout stamp basically is a uh, stamp on adult anglers who want to fish for trout. It's in addition to the basic fishing license. Correct. And um, actually, when we created that stamp, the, the uh, revenue we got from the stamp covered about 57% of the costs it takes to raise a catchable trout. Um, today, because of the fact that we haven't raised the, the fee for that trout stamp, it's only about 37% uh, of, of the cost of raising those trout. So if we got rid of the, rid of the stamp, we'd have to uh, reduce the number of catchable trout that we could raise because we wouldn't have the revenue to raise them. Right. Um on the subject of trout, um, there's been a lot of initiative lately, the last few years, and uh, even picked up last year a little more on uh, wild trout resources in Pennsylvania. Yeah, there has. We had a, uh, the first ever wild trout summit. We've had trout summits before, but they've really been dominated by catchable trout because we got a lot of anglers interested in catchable trout. They cost us a lot of money, but a lot of anglers really didn't understand what we actually do for wild trout. So this gave us the opportunity to bring staff in both in, our staff as well as staff from Penn State, Penn State University, U.S. Geological Surveys, and believe it or not, DCNR, and how they're managing wild trout on state forests and state parks. And we all talked about what we're doing now, and we got input from the public. We had over 250 people come to that wild trout summit and give us ideas about how we can do it better. And you're, uh, in terms of wild trout, you've, you're partnering with, uh, you continue to partner with a number of universities and colleges across Pennsylvania to do surveys to find additional streams that have wild trout in them. 
Absolutely, Marcus. That that's, continues to be a priority for us, and we're going to continue to invest in that unassessed waters program. We're going to go out and try to find what streams ha support wild trout, get those listed on a wild trout list or a Class A wild trout list, which are our best of our best streams, and then turn that information over to DEP so that they get those streams on a protected use list. Uh, so to make sure that those wild trout are protected. As we see Marcellus development continue to uh, uh, you know, wells drilled on our mountaintops that have never seen wells drilled before. Uh, so our wild trout are at different risks. A lot of people don't know, but we've uh, increased that inventory to the point where 30% of our 86,000 miles of streams and rivers are in a wild trout watershed. <clears throat> so that's a tremendous um, uh, increase in knowledge that we can use to make sure those wild trout are protected. Right. Um, tell me again the the staffing levels, how they have gone down in the past uh, several years. Yeah, we were about 430. Well, our maximum complement was 432. And because of um, the need to pay these extra health care and, and pension expenses, we had to start reducing costs unless we generated more revenue. And to offset those expenses, we started not filling positions. It was all through attrition. So we looked around the agency. Right now, we're, for example, we're down 18 officers in law enforcement. We've got 18 vacant districts. But we can't afford to run a school because the school costs us $1.5 million to run, and then it costs $2 million to pay the salaries and benefits of the officers that come out of the school. So I'm committed to running a school as soon as we get a fee increase, a license fee increase, or other revenue increases that would allow us to be able to run the school and fill those gaps. The same holds true for the other program, fisheries, engineering, hatcheries. Uh, we're down, we're, we have vacant positions across the agency since we went from 432 down to 378. And when you say uh, in the, the field officers, you said there's 18 uh, waterways conservation officers positions open right now? Yes. That means that those districts either are being covered uh, by someone in an adjoining district very often that's taken on double duty, basically. Exactly. And I'm really proud of our officers, again, tightening that belt. They are the thin green line, we call them. But they really tighten their belt to pick up the slack uh, to try to weather the storm until we can get that revenue increase. Right. I I'm also getting questions about handicap access. Um, is, is there anything new coming up in handicap access out there? Well, right now we're in a survival mode. So we're trying to maintain and operate the accesses we have and we really can't develop new accesses. We're always looking for places to put handicap accesses, uh, but right now we're not in the position. In fact, we're, we, we've we actually closed a couple accesses, not handicap access, but accesses because we can't afford to keep them open. We can't pay to, to keep them dredged and cleaned so that boaters don't get stuck in the mud when they launch their boats. Once the Muncie access, for example, up on the west branch of the Susquehanna River. Right. Which, with canoes and kayaks, you could easily still use that one up there. But uh... Well, believe it or not, we actually had kayakers that were stuck in the mud waist deep, which we felt was a public safety hazard. So we closed the tall boating, uh, even to kayakers and canoers, for fear that somebody was going to get, get um, you know, somebody's going to drown because they get, they get stuck in, at the access area. Okay. Okay. Um, are there any big regulation changes coming up this year? Um, I don't really have any in the forecast. Uh, and, you know, our, our priorities have been to try to, you know, um, become stable financially so that we can sustain the operations that we have. Uh, even if we got a license increase, we're not going to grow operations. Um, but, but, you know, we've shrunk. So a lot of times they say it's, it's productive if you shrink and then grow back to today's standards. Maybe a lot of the programs that, that we've uh, gotten rid of uh, will replace with new programs to try to get more people excited to fish and boat. Right. Um, here's a question. Why not a bass stamp? That's another, that would be a voluntary stamp because if it was mandatory, we'd have to, we'd have to get the legislature to approve it. And right now we don't want anything to compete with our license fee increase proposal, but a voluntary bass stamp might be one of the options along with muskie and, and, um, and, 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 and other species of fish. Okay. Um, is there a bass rearing program going right now in any of the hatcheries? We uh, stock uh, bass fingerlings in some lakes to get them restarted. You know, as we draw down lakes, fix dams, and refill lakes, a lot of times we'll have to restock those lakes to get the fishery started. But to actively manage a fishery with fingerling stocking, we were under a lot of pressure to stock the Susquehanna with fingerlings because of the, you know, all the young fish that were dying. 
Uh, but the problem is the ones we stock would have gotten the same bacterial gill uh, infections that we, the, the, the wild ones were. And we, we just can't produce enough uh, fry and fingerlings to really make a difference uh, in, in rivers or, or lakes because uh, usually natural reproduction is, is, is what's required to, repop, or to sustain a, a bass fishery, either smallmouth or largemouth. In, in lakes or rivers in Pennsylvania. Okay. Here's another question. What uh, would what is the proposed level of a new license fee? We had a table. Uh, Senate Bill 30 is, is a bill that would give us uh, the ability to set our own fees. However, we knew that we didn't want a blank check from the legislature. We needed to like, give them some certainty about what we would do it. So uh, we would be looking at a $6 uh, basic license fee for resident licenses basic license fee increase with a 3% incremental increase every year for four years. That way it lessens the burden of the initial fee increase on anglers and boaters, but at the same time gets us to where we need to get to in terms of revenue stream to pay those extra expenses. Okay. And I should should uh, point out at this point, the, there is no new fee that has been approved. It needs to go through the legislature. I, this, this was a question from one of our viewers, and I want to make sure they understand. We're not talking about fees that are coming this year. Uh, We're talking about proposals at this point need to go through the legislative process. That's absolutely right. And if I would say if your viewers really understand our need and don't want us to cut programs and, and, and so that we can sustain operations, talk to your local le legislators, senators and House representatives, tell them to vote for Senate Bill 30 and get it through so that we can go back to the business of, you know, protecting our Commonwealth fisheries and providing fishing and boating opportunities. Well, you could say go back to, I don't think you've abandoned it. Oh, we haven't. No, but go back to everything that we can do with the, with the revenues we have. We've really cut operations, but you know, that those cuts have been transparent to the anglers and boaters because Again, we haven't reduced stockings, and we, we have reduced law enforcement efforts, so the streams that um, you know, used to be protected uh, at higher levels don't see the kind of attention they, they should be getting with, with law enforcement. Right. When a, uh, when, in the past, when license fees have been raised, we've seen what? Like the first year that they're raised, there's been about a 10% drop-off in license sales, and then it's eventually recovered from that? Yeah, that's an interesting question, Marcus, because things changed in 1990. Prior to 1990, every time we increased fees, we'd lose some sales, but those would recover pretty quickly until we continued to grow fishing and boating interest, and they peaked out at 1.2 million in 1990. Then after 1990, something happened, not in, just in Pennsylvania, but all around the country. And every time we increased fees, we lost 8 to 10% sales, but we didn't recover them. That's why we, we went from 1.2 million license sales down to 860,000 today. And even without license uh, fee increases, it continues to go down, doesn't it? It does. It, 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 it's fairly stable since we have an increase. It's up a couple, up one year, down another year. Um, so we haven't seen the dramatic declines that, that like we see right after we increase fees. Um, but, um, for example, this year, so far this year, now we haven't sold a lot of licenses this year since we began selling them in December. We're down about uh, 4%. And last year we were down about 4% compared to the year before. But the year before, we were up about 6% uh, over the year before that. So they, they fluctuate some, uh, but they're pretty much static right now. Okay. Well, I, I think it's uh, about time to wrap up here, but I will remind the viewers why, why I'm here talking with John Arway, the Executive Director of Fish and Boat Commission, Pennsylvania Fish and Boat Commission, is because they have a series of sportsmen's forums coming up where they're going to be looking for, uh, well, why don't you explain it again, John? Yeah, we really want your input, angler and boater input, conservation input. Anybody's interested in clean water, healthy habitats, and, health, and, and, and good sustainable fisheries, we want your input into how we can take it to the next step and in the future. Uh, today, um, I always say I, we have better fishing opportunities today than when I was a child. I want to leave that to my grandchildren. I want to make sure they have more waters to fish, my grandchildren, your grandchildren, more waters to fish uh, when, when they're my age than they had when they were young. So that's really the, uh, the impetus for these meetings is to get angler input into the next strategic plan that we're moving forward into, Marcus. Okay, thank you, John.